Good afternoon. My name is Belinda Kemp and I'm the Senior Scientist in Enology at the Cool Climate, Enology and Fiticulture Institute, Covey, as we know it, here at Brock University. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the effect on honey and dusty off flavours and acetic acid in sparkling wines that have been made from different amounts of sour, rotten grapes. There will be time for questions at the end, but there will be a time lapse between you sending me the questions and me getting them because they'll be coming to me via uh, text messages. Uh, so bear with us for that. And also it's the first time that we're using the life size platform for the Covey lecture. So uh, hopefully there'll be no glitches, but again, please bear with me on that. So today I'm going to talk to you um, about a number of things, but I'm going to first start off by giving you background to the study, uh, what we're working on for the next few years. We talk briefly about what sour rot is, uh, very briefly, because that's not my area of expertise, but um, I will be talking more as well about what is the honey dusty off flavour that I'm talking about, which, uh, which winemakers we consider as uh, faults in wine. I'm going to talk a bit more about what happens to those compounds during ripening and explain to you about our different treatments. I'm going to give you some initial results from juice and uh, base wine analysis. I'm going to talk to you about what it means, what the results mean to date, and uh, some future research that we have under our belts to, to do, and questions. Uh, so please, as I said, uh, when you do want to send messages for uh, that have questions in, just allow for the time lapse um, for me to answer. So what is sour rot? Well, these are some lovely pictures that came to me courtesy of Dr. Wendy McFadden-Smith uh, from Omafra. And you can see along the top the bunches uh, of grapes. And no, these ones, they're actually Pinot Noir. You can see the discoloration. What, of course, you can't smell is the absolutely vile vinegar smell from the acetic acid smell that comes that you can smell before you go in. So um, the bottom pictures, just looking at my emails, the bottom pictures are of white varieties. And you can see the lightly colored brown grapes that give off, uh, that rot, basically are rot, uh, sour rot, and give off that horrible acetic acid vinegary smell. Um, and you can, it's something you can smell before you even get to the vine. So it's quite awful. And I'm going to just uh, talk a little bit about it because sour rot comes from a combination of factors. So things like wounding and berry splitting but also from yeast, bacteria, fungi, and of course can be spread by vinegar flies really easily. Part of the rotting process comes from non-saccharomyces yeast as well, um, but those non-saccharomyces yeast can differ in species, and that will depend on the region um, and the vineyard site, um, et cetera. What, it, what, co what happens to the grapes is that it causes a decrease in bricks, and that's from the conversion of sugar to acetic acid, which we know is vinegar. But it also means that it increases things like gluconic acid, uronic acid, ethyl acetate, which is, smells like nail varnish as it gets higher and higher, but as low concentrations can be really a uh, lovely smell. And glycerol. What's most important though is the oxidation of ethanol into acetic acid. Uh, which is vinegar. Now it's at this stage I'm going to leave the sour rot in the vineyard aspect uh, of the talk today and I'm going to direct you to my colleague Wendy McFadden-Smith at Omafra and her website. Uh, well all her, sorry, all her reports are on the uh, OGWRI website and there's a link at the bottom of the page so if you go to the Ontario Grape and Wine Research .com, and look at the projects, you'll see the project reports from about sour rot that have taken place uh, here on Ontario. Of course, there's other people around the world. It is a problem that can occur in Germany, for instance, Portugal, Spain, Italy. And I'm going to look at some of those studies uh, in a moment. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is why, why we don't want, not like, uh, acetic acid or ethyl acetate in wine. And one of the most important things I need to explain to you at this stage is what a detection threshold is. Because it's basically, when we do it in, in, in our, as a panel and put it together uh, for sensory analysis, the concentration basically at which 75% is 
correct detection. And we use a large panel of about 35 and over people to be able to work out exactly at what level or what concentration of the compound you can actually detect it in the wine. Now that's separate from the rejection threshold, which is something else, which is when it becomes too much in the wine. So acetic acid, you only need a tiny amount. It's actually 0 0.8 grams per litre that we can actually detect it. The rules here in Ontario under the VQA state that uh, we cannot have more than 1.3 grams per litre uh, of acetic acid in wine. However, it does differ with, with wine style. So, for instance, ice wine will have more levels of acetic acid in it. Ethyl acetate, however, uh, for white wine, the level at which we can detect it is 170 milligrams per litre and red uh, slightly lower at 160. And again, that can differ between wine styles, though, uh, and Madeira will have much higher uh, levels of ethyl acetate in it. And as I said, you know, at, at low levels, they can they, they bestow lovely flavours. It's when it gets higher and higher and higher, that's the problem. What are the two honey flavours I'm going to talk about and spend time on today? Well, one is phenylacetic acid, which is the precursor. It's a monocarboxylic acid. But what's really interesting about this compound, because it is a controlled substance, because it is involved in, or it can be used for making illicit drugs. So it is, is was quite difficult to get it into Canada, but we managed at the, in, in, <laughs> at the end. Um, but it has a role as a toxin, a plant metabolite. It's also a Saccharomyces cerevisiae, a yeast metabolite. It's also a plant growth retardant an allergen and an auxin. So uh, it plays many parts in, in uh, many parts in plants and in yeast. It's actually formed from the degradation of an amino acid called phenylalanine, which is uh, involved in many flavor compounds or the synthesis of many flavor compounds in our, uh, in our wine. We think at the moment it comes from the shikimic acid pathway, but we're not entirely sure about that. But it is uh, what's important about this is it's the precursor for the lovely uh, honey compound, which is called ethyl phenyl acetate. So it's it's uh, that's its acetate ester. And that's produced from phenylacetic acid uh, by some yeast, not all yeast, uh, but some yeast but it uh, escalates and increases during maturation, whether that's in tank or bottle. In the case of sparkling wine, it's going to be in bottle or traditional method. Um, and it is a fault. I'm going to talk a little bit more now. Now, the detection threshold for these two compounds is different uh, to the acetic acid and the ethyl acetate. So phenylacetic acid in red wine, the detection level is 73 micrograms per litre, so quite low. And ethyl phenyl acetate in sparkling wine can be detected at 263 micrograms per litre. We actually did the detection level threshold for that compound at Brock University. Um, and, uh, and that's how we got, I, I'm quoting that level and I've been, uh, we published some of that uh, work, well, at conferences, I've presented at conferences about that. Now the consumer rejection thresholds are, is when people just won't drink it. We reject the wine and we, we don't like it and we won't take it in. And that's been found in red wine to be 140 micrograms per litre yeah, of the lovely honey compound, but it's precursor 700. And what's important about this is that it's when these two compounds are together in the wine that causes the problem, causes the fault. If you've got one, it's not so bad, it, or more importantly, it doesn't actually get detected so much. And the same with, with the nicer honey ester compound. But it's that combination when there are those levels that causes horrible, moldy, dusty flavors um, that we don't want in wine. Um, we haven't worked out what exactly the consumer rejection threshold is in, uh, in sparkling wine. It could be much lower, it could be much, much higher. Um, we don't know at the moment. Uh, we did try, but we didn't have a lack. We had a lack of 75% agreement on our panel, so we weren't able to accept that those numbers. And you'll see Winnie the Pooh there with his uh, honey-flavored sparkling wine. 
So detection and rejection thresholds are actually quite interesting because we're all so different when it comes to tasting and what we can perceive, or, and of course, what we like and don't like. And that goes for many faults in wine. Some don't care at all, as you can see from the sideways film, um, and, uh, and some people really hate it. And there's many flavors that do that in wine. Um, and not just in wine, you know, in other drinks like beer and cider, uh, but it's, uh, it's the why we take the majority and need 75% from a, from a large panel when we come to accept numbers for detection and rejection thresholds. So just to explain, so we have our two honey compounds at the detection levels that you saw, plus uh, this in the sparkling wine there, and it gives us these musty, moldy, dusty, and of course balsamic um, vinegar flavors. Um, but that's not the full story because we're not entirely sure whether it fluctuates during aging, whether it stops at a certain level, what the levels are in wines. So, um, as we know, uh, if we look at it from the case of wine, as we know, the ethyl acetate, the lovely honey flavor, I'm going to call it EPHA from now on, um, is produced from its, uh, its less welcome compound, the uh, phenol acetic acid. Um, it can increase during wine making and wine aging, and that's because of the addition of nitrogen and because some yeast produce much higher levels of it than others. What we don't know at all is whether any yeast decrease these compounds at all, and no studies have, uh, have looked at that. It's also important to know there are other honey flavors uh, in wine that come from a range of compounds, but because they're not associated in any way with sour rot, we're not going to, I'm not going to be talking about those today. We know from previous studies that these honey compounds only are problematic and cause the dusty, musty flavors when they come from sour rot. So is it a fault in wine? Well, sometimes what might happen is the winemaker can detect it and it doesn't get as far as the shelf. They might stay in their stainless steel tanks or in their oak barrels. It could be blended with something else. Um, so it might not necessarily make it to market. It is a fault. It has been found to be a fault in red wines that were on the shelves uh, for sale in Italy, Spain and Portugal. And one of the grape varieties from Italy that's been problematic is a grape variety called Agli Anico. Um, uh, and it does produce these horrible, unpleasant, musty flavours. Um, and aromas really first, really it's the aroma. But what one of the, what, if you define a fault in wine, I guess in some ways you could say that at high concentrations of a compound that mask all others, then it is a fault when it gets to there. But again, you know, as I said, whether it, whether it comes, the wine comes out of the winery and if it gets bottled or is just blended, don't always know. But again, we have to remind, remember that it's a combination of these two compounds at certain levels that causes the problem. So when looking into these compounds, one of the things I thought was quite interesting is we keep throughout all the text and the scientific publications that are available, we, we always refer to this com these compounds as honey of flavors. And I thought, well, how, that's very well, we understand it, but how would consumers uh, look at it? And is it really a fault in honey? Is it present in honey? Well, actually, the two compounds are in honey itself. Um, EPHA, the, the ester, is actually an authenticity marker for honey made from thyme in Italy. And the phenolacetic acid is actually the same. It's a botanical marker for honey made in Croatia, but they're not together in honey. Um, certainly not in any of the studies I could, I could see. I, there might be, I'm not a honey expert, but there might be. But the fact that they're present separately and used as um, botanical markers in specific honey types is quite interesting. So let's just have a look for one second um, and look at honey. This is uh, the, from the American Honey Society, this diagram. Now they do also have flavor wheels like the whiskey flavor wheels, the wine flavor wheels. They also have honey flavor wheels. You can have a look on their website. Um, but I'm using this for today, and I want you to take in the final column on my on the right, just circled with the blue, and you'll see some of the descriptors associated what is referred to in honey as spoiled. 
So I guess that would be to us in some ways a fault in wine is how we refer to it. And you'll see under the earthy column, musty, basement, smells, mouldy, mildew, um, smells and flavours, and also fermentation, vinegar, beer, salt. So I guess part of that would be your acetic acid. So possibly the musty, basement, mouldy, rotting flavours that are in there could quite possibly be describing the two compounds that we're looking at uh, with regards to grapes, because we use those same sort of descriptors for that. But of course, we don't know until we match the two up. Uh, and have a look. But it's quite interesting that it is considered a fault in honey, just as much as it's considered a fault in wine. So back, let's leave honey for a moment um, and let's return back to wine and to our studies. Um, and what we've been noticing in Ontario um, and particularly in sparkling wines made from Pinot Noir grapes, which are susceptible to sour rot, are some of those flavours and those compounds I was describing, which was really what set off this study last year. One of the river wine writer in, in British Columbia, Anthony Gismondi, and he did mention and tweeted out one day about there's less honey and sweetness is a, is a path to complexity and style, sort of bemoaning in his text at the time about the uh, the honey flavours. Now, whether it was low, co low concentrations of these compounds or whether he just doesn't like honey, I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to ask Anthony about it in more detail. Um, but it is interesting that it is something that we notice, particularly in our own wine cellars as well um, as elsewhere, is a fluctuation of these com these flavours being prolific during ageing as this, the, the sparkling wines are ageing on lees. So the project details to actually investigate a bit more about this um, starts off with the main objectives being to quantify the two compounds plus ethyl acetate and acetic acid from clean and sour rot grapes during ripening. One of the reasons for that is we do wonder whether it could possibly be that one or both of those honey compounds could be a biomarker or a predictor of sour rot so that we could see if sour rot was setting in to the grapes before the acetic acid um, smell comes out. We also want to produce, well, we are producing Pinot Noir sparkling and still red wines with varying amounts of sour rot to determine the levels of the four compounds we're interested in. And we're also a major part of this, an important part, is looking at the potential of the Brock yeast CN1 that's been isolated by Debbie English lab uh, to reduce acetic acid and the two honey compounds in both sparkling and still wine. Now, because of time constraints and because we, we've got an incredible amount of data just from year one, I'm not going to talk to you about the CN1 yeast for today, um, just the work that we've done with the, EC, with the EC1188 yeast. Um, but that will be coming later and we'll release that information later on along with the red wines when we get further, further down, but not today, not in today's lecture. So every year um, at Covey, as you know, we, uh, we monitor the ripening levels of Pinot Noir, well, all, quite a few grape varieties, not just Pinot Noir, but I've taken this from our pre-harvest ripening site. This is site two Pinot Noir, which is actually the site that we used um, for our study on the sour rot grapes. Um, well, part of it, not, not all of it, but it is one of our collaborative partners. And so I wanted to just show you the, you can see here in the green line is the bricks level as the sugar rises up. And you can see the blue line is the acidity levels as they decrease. Then you've got the pH. And these red bars are the acetic acid levels. So they're not changing. Uh, all that much. And that was what was quite interesting in 2019. We actually uh, were looking a lot last year for sites that had sour rot, and as luck would have it, it wasn't uh, quite as prolific as it has been in, in a year before. So that proved to be slightly challenging, but we found uh, one in the end, which was good news for them, not so, so much good news for us. But we did have a look at these two honey compounds, going back to the question about whether they could be a biomarker uh, in those in the same wine grapes that you just saw being 
uh, their, their BRICS and TA levels uh, during ripening. And you can see here that on the left is the precursor, the phenylacetic acid. And on the right, at much lower levels, you can see from the two different scales, very different, uh, is the acetate ester, the nicer honey compound, as, as I also referred to it, but much lower levels. So neither of them reach their threshold limits. What, what is interesting is they both have exactly the same trend, which is good um, and useful for us. You will see a massive rise, like a, a huge jump up. But if you look at the dates, the 24th of September to the 8th of October, we're missing uh, a date point, unfortunately, which would give you more of a climb as opposed to a jump up to that scale. But you can see that it's once we get to around 15 bricks, which is what it was a uh, uh, the 24th of September, we start climbing in those levels. But what's really interesting is all the acetic acid levels, uh, the vinegar um, compound, were all below 0 0.2 grams per litre throughout sampling, so we're no bother at all. But these compounds are creeping up. However, we do need more data. We can't just uh, recommend a compound as a biomarker with just one year of data. We've got two more years to go through this. But that same trend is happening in both, which is hopeful. And then we brought all the grapes into the winery and made the wine. That's a simplified version. But actually what we then did when we had to hand pick the sourwood grapes first, then we hand picked the clean bunches. They were kept completely separate. We brought them into the winery and we whole bunch pressed the sourwood grapes first and uh, and then set, cleaned everything down obviously and then whole bunch pressed the clean grapes. They were settled down uh, with enzymes for 24 hours and to ensure that only the yeast we were inoculating the, the fermentations with and there was no to ensure there was nothing else in there we sterile filtered the juice. The treatments for the sour rod, uh, we did 15 litre fermentations in triplicate last year. The treatment was zero sour rot juice, and that basically was our control. It meant that we only had clean juice in that fermentation, nothing else at all. Then we had, uh, what, the next one had 10% of sour rot, and this is in 15 litres, so it was 1.5 litres. That 15 litres was sour rot. The same with 20%, 30%, and 40%. So we're going slightly high, uh, at 40 litres, because I can't imagine any winemaker would add that, but that's important in a scientific trial to go from zero to higher and then different increments in between. We inocul We had 30 wines in the end because we inoculated uh, with EC111H yeast and also with the CN1 yeast I mentioned. And we did need to add yan as well to the juice, um, so we used Fermaid K in two batches. The wine is actually a base wine at the moment, um, sitting in quarantine itself in the cold room uh, at Covey Winery. And then when we get when we get back, one of the first things to do is to bottle it for second fermentation. So build the yeast up for second fermentation and, and add the liqueur to tuage. And then later on, after a year or so, um, over a year, we'll be riddling, disgorging, and dosaging it. So we'll be taking the the yeast out and adding the sugar and the wine mixture afterwards to top it up. So the juice analysis before fermentation um, was quite standard throughout it all, uh, which was which is really good starting point for us. The only thing that there is a difference, which is a slight difference, which is statistically significant, is it for the TA. And uh, you'll see that um, once you start getting 20, 30, and 40, we go up slightly on the titratable acidity, which is, of course, total acidity. And our YAN levels, you can see at the bottom there is the nitrogen levels, the amount of nitrogen that yeast can consume. So we needed to top that up to, to ensure uh, good fermentations. And our BRICS levels are 17 to 18, which is pretty standard for what we pick up here in Ontario are grapes and all our pH is the same. So a really good starting point um, to go in. Now let's have a look at the two compounds, the concentrations of the two compounds in the different treatments. On the left you'll see the precursor again, um, the uh, 
mouldy, dusty um, phenol acetic acid. And on the right is the lovely honey flavor. It's acetate ester. But what happens here is, although you can definitely see an increase of the compounds, uh, and again, stepwise going up in, in, uh, with regards to the amount put in, one of the things that's really interesting is when we do the statistical analysis, there's no statistical difference between treatments at all on the quantity. And one of the reasons, despite doing a lot of work on this, and uh, we just couldn't, I just couldn't uh, get to grips with why it wasn't statistically significant when it looks so obviously obvious that, that those steps should be. And one of the reasons is you can sort of see between those standard error bars that are on there at the top is that there's slight variability between replica wine. So one wine in each treatment, or sorry, one juice in each treatment is slightly out. So it eschews the statistics. Um, and so, but other two are exactly the same. So slightly strange um, and my, and we'll take great steps to reduce that in the future. But that sometimes happens and it's one of the reasons why we do replicate studies as well, um, of course, but we'll be looking into that more in the future. Um, and what you will see again, though, um, is these very low concentrations of both compounds and the scales are uh, much, much, uh, well, sorry, very different with the precursor being higher than the honey compound that is going to synthesize later on. The acetic acid levels in here are similar. You see those similar steps. But here you see that it is statistically significant. There is a difference now by adding that sour, the juice coming from the, the whole bunch pressed grapes. And you can see that the control EC0 uh, is where we've added no, the zero being no addition, is uh, much, much lower than the others. And of course, there we have EC40, which is the treatment code for 40% of sour root juice in there being higher, which is good. That's what we want to see from the scientist's point of view. Now we've got to see what happens with the yeast during the fermentation. Um, we did also measure in juice ethyl acetate, uh, but it was below the detection level. So we so low, such low levels, we did have not um, reported it in today's presentation. So then we look at the wine uh, chemical analysis, what's the composition of these base wines. And what we're seeing here now is that the only thing that's statistically significant is, oops, sorry, is the uh, malic acid level there. Um, and it's very small though. And if you are a winemaker, the difference between 5.3 grams per litre of malic acid, um, 5.7 is actually going to be quite small, but there is a statistical difference. Everything else um, after fermentation, like the residual sugar, the alcohol levels are all still low. Although it is quite interesting that even though there's no statistical difference, there's a small difference between the treatments having slightly higher alcohol levels than, uh, than the control but it's not statistically significant. And again, now we've also got titratable acidity with no difference at all, just for the malic acid. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at the compounds that we've now got in the base wines, our honey compounds. Well, we've got the precursor, and again, the same thing's happened. The precursor uh, has those steps going up, and you can see the concentrations change with each treatment. But again, because of uh, variability of one, one replica wine in each, each treatment for some strange reason, um, we haven't got statistical difference. But with the nice honey compound, now we're starting to see as things calm down, go through fermentation, now we're starting to see that there is a significant difference between the treatments. And our control, EC0, is lower and, of course, EC40 higher. These wines are going to go on to be made into sparkling wines and we'll be recruiting for panelists um, that lovely job of tasting all the wines and uh, they will be trained in sensory analysis to be able to explain and describe uh, the difference between those wines. So we'll be calling upon Ontario people to do that uh, soon. So again, low concentration still and again, neither of them are near the concentrations that would be a problem. However, one of the problems 
that one of the things that is going to happen is that it's going to have quite a long time on yeast lees, uh, yeast lees in the cellar after second fermentation. And then we could see the, the we're going to see a big difference between those compounds and an escalation of the phenol uh, of the honey compound. And we're going to see what happens because it's also going to be released from the yeast cells. So the acetic acid in the base wine is still not in a dangerous level. Um, if you looked at our detection levels um, that we said was 0 0.8 grams per litre earlier on, well, now we're still sitting around 0 0.17 to uh, around 0 0.22. Um, so it's still not dangerous, but it, it's interesting to see that there is um, still a difference between the treatments. If the ethyl now we what we do have in the wine though as well is we do have ethyl acetate and the concentration is only 40 to 45 milligrams per litre so still low and no statistical difference but we're going to see how that progresses um, as as the wine matures so basically do we, if we summarize the results today because we've only got one year of data at the moment but um, and all these projects major projects like these take quite a few years, three years minimum. Uh, so can we use either of those two honey compounds for as a biomarker for sour wine during grape ripening? Well, you can definitely see that it, there is an increase in it, even though there's a big jump, a big climb, uh, sorry, a big jump instead of a climb. We do need more years of data to be able to confirm anything like that. We can't, we, we can't tell people to use those compounds as a biomarker for the time being to predict an, out, an outbreak of sourot. In the juice, both those honey compounds increase with the percent of sourot, uh, which, which is what we wanted to do. And the base wines, a uh, similar sort of situation, but con concentrations are still below threshold levels. But that doesn't account for, as I said, the aging of the wine. And we've got to reconcile and have a look at the sensory analysis of these final sparkling wines when they finally become sparkling wines versus the chemical analysis and the compound concentrations of the compounds in the wines. So we still need to bottle the wine. Uh, as, as I said, it's in quarantine itself. And we'll be comparing the data from the EC111H yeast to the CN1 yeast um, all the way through this as well. We need to finish the chemical analysis of the sparkling wines and certainly during it, monitoring them during aging. Do we think the concentrations will fluctuate of those honey compounds during aging? I would hope so, <laughs> but, um, but we don't know until we actually measure that. Uh, we've got two more vintages, the 2020 and 2021 to do. Sensory analysis of all those wines, and that takes quite a few months as well. And then what we really need to, um, to do is talk to the winemakers and transfer this knowledge that we the knowledge that we gained from this study to the winemakers to look at ways and to consider ways that they could manage this this these compounds for instance we know that by adding dap or more nutrients uh, into the mix of the that that can also elevate these um, compounds to the level that they become false so that combined with the lees aging, if you've got some in the beginning already in the wine, what's going to happen to that before uh, later on? Of course, in traditional method wine, we can't keep it, uh, we can't uh, blend it. It's bottled now, so we can't blend it at all. So <clears throat> then, just before we go to questions, I want to bring up the fact that there's some acknowledgements to make. We have a lot of people working on all our big projects like this. So um, Shao was uh, with us and Wendy McFadden Smith, who, who helped us identify and worked with us on the, in the field um, with regards to Samarot. Shufin, Rachel, Jen, uh, Debbie, uh, who's my co-supervisor on this project, and uh, and also Adela for drawing the and also Amy and Amy at Vineland Research and Innovation for all their work with us at the moment on the consumer sensory side and the sparkling wine those for the sparkling wine bottle graphics that they did for me which have become extremely useful. Most important are our funding partners though, which is CGCN the great the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network 
and OGWRI, the Ontario Grape and Wine Research. Without that funding, um, this sort of work cannot be carried out. And our in-kind in partners include Andrew Peller, Hubel Grapes Estates, and Malcolm Laurie for his vineyard as well. I've got some references for those of you that are interested, or I can send the presentation to you so you can read some more. And it's at this point, I'm going to ask you if you have any questions at all, because there's quite a lot of points uh, going through. Just having a look, I've got nothing at the moment, but please do, if you do have any questions, uh, do send them through. Um, as, I, as you can see, we only covered the EC1118 uh, yeast today. Um, but there's the CN1 yeast, and there's the Pinot Noir red wine with the EC1118 and the CN1 yeast as well. So quite a lot to do. Debbie, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, presented as part of the Covey Lecture Series some of her work with regards to the CN1 yeast, um, and hopefully we'll put the whole thing together. So um, I've got one question come through. Where was the trial conducted? Good question. Um, I should have actually mentioned that it actually was conducted in a vineyard in Niagara on the lake. Um, and it's one of our partners that we work with quite a lot on a number of uh, things. We actually work with them on a leaf removal trial um, and they let us go in there. What, and I've got another mess, uh, question that's just come through. What are the sensory methods they plan to use for this project? That's a really good question because this is, um, uh, we, we need to be able to look at specific flavours. So one of the things we were we put in the grant proposal originally was to look at uh, use a method called Ticata, uh, which is um, which will identify concentrations of how we perceive the flavours as they go higher or lower by and you'll be able to actually graph it out. And so using Ticata, which is um, temporal check all that applies is what the actual method's called and we'll be looking into doing that but of course before we do that we we'll want to do a, a difference test and we want to have a look at whether there's a difference between all the treatments and if there's no sensory perceptive difference um, then there's no point going forward and doing more detailed study uh, but the temporal check all that apply will be the method that we'll be we'll be using anybody have any further questions quite a lot to take in i know um, and i possibly spoke slightly too fast again um i haven't got any questions from anyone else at the moment um so it's a bit quicker than i had anticipated no would you like me to go back anybody like me to go back to any slides or to go over i've also got a slight uh, as i said there's a time lapse going through the next steps, yes. Um, we the next step is as we get back to Covey and and hopefully uh, that will be soon. We will be looking at bottling the wine, so building up uh, the yeast for liquor to tirage, which means then we will insert that into the bottles, and we we'll always do that with um, fielding estate winery with Ritchie over there. Then we'll be looking at those compounds during fermentation, during um, aging, because once they've gone through second fermentation, that's when these compounds are going to elevate uh, and increase each week. And so we'll go and collect those and analyze those. And then after we've disgorged, two to three months after disgorging, usually we try to aim for about three months after disgorging, the dosage has gone in with the sugar then we'll uh, we'll look at doing we'll, we will have planned all the sensory during that time and we will uh, do sensory analysis panel um we still aren't entirely sure with the sparkling wine what to do with regards to the dosage whether we add any sugar at all because we don't actually want to mask these flavors um but equally it would be quite interesting to see the difference if we did add different sugar uh, concentrations but got to keep on track with what we're actually doing and um, before branching off slightly somewhere um, so, and then of course we've got this harvest coming. Oh, I've got some more questions coming through. This harvest coming, so we'll be planning to uh, monitor some of the sites this week, this year again, as we do with the pre-harvest monitoring each year. But this time we'll also look at possibly more vineyard sites, so that we analyse the grapes from 
different vineyards for these two compounds and not rely on one vineyard as we, we did in the data that I showed you today. So that would be one thing. And I've got here, how high was the VA in the juice used for the sparkling wine? Um, that was um, slightly earlier on. The, it was 0 0.2 uh, grams per litre, and that's in acetic acid. We measure volatile acidity as acetic acid, and there was no ethyl acetate in the juice. Um, well, it was so low we couldn't actually measure it. It was below the levels of detection of the method, uh, so we, which was which was done under GCFID. So we, I haven't presented those, um, but actually quite low. But that. You know, like anything that happens each year, you have different ripeness levels. We have different chemical composition of the juice. Uh, we will have different levels of the honey compounds. We'll have different levels of acetic acid and ethyl acetate. Um, so really, that's one of the reasons why we need more than one year and two more years of data to be able to give us a much clearer picture. But we're moving forward. Uh, one. I've got a qu another question here. Is this an issue for winemakers all over the world in sparkling wine production? That's a really good question, and it depends if you're in a region or, on, or your vineyard site suffers from sour water at all. Um, it's more a problem for Pinot Noir, which is uh, thin skin, so it's very susceptible. So uh, if you have Pinot Noir growing that you use specifically for sparkling, or for still red wine, actually, um, and you start seeing sour water appearing, then then yes, um, it can be. It is a problem. Sour water's all over the world. It's in Germany. That can happen in Portugal, Italy, Spain. They're the ones I, I'm saying straight off, um, uh, off the back of my head, because there, there's quite a few studies. The studies that are available on sour water, particularly of these compounds, are coming from those countries. And again, they're particular grape varieties that are susceptible um, in each of those countries. But uh, it goes back to me saying, if if there's a fault in a wine, in a sparkling wine that's in the ella, in the cellar aging, and you can smell and taste it, you're not going to release it, and you'll see what it does in another year or so. Um, so how many, how to exactly report whether it's a problem worldwide is quite a difficult thing for me to do. Hopefully people will let me, at some point I could do a, a report, a, a survey maybe, um, and find out if it is. I've got some more question, another question here. Alcohol in the base wines is low, quite low compared to commercial wines. Since the compounds pro are produced during fermentation, would it be valuable to capitalize juice to a standardized potential alcohol representation, representative of commercial base wines? Mm. That's a really good question, actually. I quite like that idea. I hadn't thought of that um, at this stage, but that's certainly something I can discuss uh, with my colleague um, and, uh, and also with a graduate student who we have starting in September and have a look, bring the alcohol level up a bit by you by capitalizing yeah i wouldn't say no to that um i think that's a really good idea thank you so we will certainly consider it i like that thank you for whoever said that um and i think that's uh that's it for the time being of course one of the problems to consider in spa in uh, in answer to that last question in in sparkling wine research is if you do something one year, you've got to do the same thing next year. So just because we're low in alcohol, slightly lower in alcohol this year than we had hoped to be, and we add sugar, then next year we might we might be fine and not add sugar. So we have to weigh up the pros and cons of this because really we need to do the same thing year in and year out. So I take on board what you're saying with regards to commercial wines, and then uh, as I said, Debbie and I will probably discuss that and see if we. We can do that. Um, I quite, I do like that idea. But as I said, it depends on the experimental design whether we can we can do that. And I think I, I gather that's all the questions for today. So thank you very much. Please do email me if you have any questions about it, and um, and let me know if you'd be interested in in survey results. It certainly I could certainly do a survey on using. Um, Survey Monkey or something to find out a bit more about whether it's a worldwide problem. But as I said, it certainly is a problem in some of the countries um, that I mentioned. Uh, so thank you very much indeed.